Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Both of them drank, and it was chaotic. My brother and sister are six and seven years older than me, and they were responsible for me, which I didn't know it was a big deal because I thought it was easy to take care of at that time, like every child does, but um, learned a lot of things about how to deal with alcoholism at a young age. For me, it was stay quiet, don't cause trouble, and then do what you want to do. And that behavior as a child sort of comes up later on. But I think they should have known there was a problem. I stayed at a babysitter's house. I don't know why, because my mother didn't work, but I guess she probably had a hangover. And so she couldn't watch me all the time. And I stayed with this babysitter who I think the man was a Vietnam vet who was an alcoholic. And the wife, I'm not quite sure... I don't remember, a little foggy, but I learned something from them. They had this record player, and it always there was one album I listened to all the time. And my parents were having to get together at their house, and I came down the stairs. I think I was like five. And I started singing, I like beer. It makes me a jolly good fellow. I'm five. <laughs> they should have known at that point in time there might be a problem here. <laughs> so I say all that because, you know, I went through life. I didn't drink a lot in um, high school until about my senior year. And I wanted to be cool like everyone else. My parents, my mother got sober, but my dad was still drinking. Um, and I just, I liked the risk. I, I enjoyed getting away with stuff. And it was fun. You know, I wouldn't change any of that. You know, when I look back, I'm like, that was good times. Until it wasn't, and that's why I'm here. Um, So I drank and did all of those things. Went to college. Everything went well. Um, I'm from Ohio. So I went to Auburn University, and that was a long way from home. And to be able to go to school there, I could do whatever I wanted. Nobody knew. And it was perfect. All I had to do was keep my grades up, come home on the holidays, pretend like everything's normal, and you'll be fine. I made it. I made it out of school. Got a teaching job here in Atlanta. That was really cool because I moved into Virginia Highlands. And if you're familiar with the area, it's a great place for a person who likes to drink. And I found out what live music was like. And I enjoyed it. And I began this going to work, being a teacher. And then when I wasn't at work, I was a drinker. I was a partier. And you all know the progression. So obviously I'm getting to the point where I'm two people. You know, I have this life where when I go to school, everybody looks up to me and they think I'm wonderful and I'm innocent. I have my teacher closet, all my teacher clothes. And then I have my let's go be a groupie girl clothing. And I was good at balancing them. And it went, it went well for a while. And, um, I ended up dating some people in the bands because that was a lot of fun and had some good times and started playing with some other substances, which made it a little more difficult. So the drinking, it just progressed and progressed and progressed And I don't like to talk a lot about the past, you know, in a meeting, because here's the deal. We all know it was fun at the beginning, and then it sucked at the end, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here talking. So I don't want to focus too much on that, but I do want to tell you that when I started drinking, I liked it. I genuinely liked drinking. And I I would tell you, you know, I'm so glad I quit. You know, I think that stuff was horrible, but I don't want to lie to you. What I didn't like was what it did to my life. It tore me up. It brought me to my knees. So although I went for many years um, 
let's see, I got to Atlanta in 1993, and I was a heavy drinker. By 2002, I was, let's say, 30 pounds lighter than I am now. I couldn't talk. I was just about to lose my teaching career. You kind of know how that is, right? <laughs> so if, if I could have kept drinking like I did at the beginning, like, you know, those people I don't like, the ones that can drink socially, if I could have done that successfully, I promise you I would still be doing it right now. But the reality is I'm different. When I drink, I can't stop. And it took me a long time to accept that. It took me a long time to say, oh my gosh, this doesn't work for me. I used to think it was everybody else's fault, all the chaos in my life, all the problems I had. I could have sworn it was your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. Never mind the fact that I can't walk from my house to the car without needing a sip out of a bottle. That wasn't my problem at all. So in 2002, you know, one thing this program has taught me is there is a power greater than me. And I didn't know it in 2002. But what happened was I told you I was playing in other substances. And I don't think I had slept a good sleep in over two weeks. You know, I was just getting enough sleep to function. And I get a call. My mother was very, very sick. She was fighting liver cancer. And I, the call was, you need to get to Florida now. Well, you know, when you're, you're drinking and doing stuff, that's kind of inconvenient. Now, how sick is that? I said, well, I'll be there. And when I sort of came to, I said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to fix everything. Because I'm not sick, remember? <laughs> I'm perfectly fine. I'm going to drive to Florida on no sleep, and I'm going to need something to help me to get there. Um, and when I get there, nobody's going to notice that I haven't slept in three weeks, that I'm 30 pounds lighter, that my eyes are black, and that I can't communicate verbally. It's all going to be fine. So I hop in my car. About six hours into the drive, I have to pull over because I can't drive anymore. And I sleep. I don't even know if I went to a rest stop, to be honest. I don't know. And then I kept going. So how I even made it to Florida is a, a mystery and probably something God took care of. Well, I know he did. And I pull in, and I made sure it was late enough that when I got there, my father, who still drinks, I was going to make sure he'd had a few cocktails in him because that way he wouldn't notice how tired and awful I looked. And the rest of the family, it would be, the lights would be low, you know, like the bar lighting is what I was envisioning in my head. And when I walk in, nobody will notice that I'm a total train wreck. And I'm like, hi, mom, how are you? I'm so sorry you don't feel well. And she is dying of cancer. And she's, she looks at me and she knows something's up, but it was late. And she's like, well, it's good to see you, honey. The next morning I wake up. And I went into the bathroom, and have you you guys probably know this feeling. You look in the mirror, and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> what is this? Because I haven't, I haven't seen my face in God knows how long, because I've been busy. And, and so I see this image, and I'm like, oh, man, we're going to need some serious makeup. And um, so I'm packing this crap on my face. Well, you all know what that looks like. <laughs> that just makes it even better. And I walk out in the beautiful Florida sunshine lighted room, and my father looks at me, and my mother, she just goes, because she has recovered from alcoholism. She had 18 years sober, and her head just fell. My father, on the other hand, is like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> I'm like, Hi. Can I get some coffee? I'm just really tired. I'm fine. My sister was there, and, and she just went, oh, hell. And I went back to the room, and I'm crying because I'm a victim. I'm a victim here. I just drove all the way from Atlanta. Why are you guys mad at me? Don't you feel sorry for me? 
I couldn't understand. My sister walked in, and she said to me, she said, Carol, you look like a walking skeleton. I can't believe you're even moving. I'm like, who are you talking to? I'm right here. That just, you know, I look back on this scenario, and I, I'm just amazed at that time I couldn't see what they saw that I couldn't see how sick I was. And so I said, well, you all just don't understand. I'm just a little tired. And she said, well, Dad has one request, and this is Mom as well. You either go into treatment now, or you drive your ass back to Atlanta and don't come back. And I'm like, huh? I just got here. Nothing's registering to me. I'm like, this is like a bad dream. Nobody understands. And I look at her and I'm like, I'm too damn tired to drive. All right. What do I have to do? You need to call a doctor. Me? Can't you do it? No. See, my family sort of had some history with this, right? So they're not playing the, oh, the poor Carol thing. They kind of get it because of everything we went through with my mother. And my dad, the funny part about my father, he still, he drinks, but he will tell you, I'm an alcoholic and I'm going to keep drinking. All right. You know, that's his choice. Do what you got to do. And I love him. Don't get me wrong. I love my father. And that's a choice he's made. You know, I could have made the same choice. You can make the same choice. So mom, on the other hand, she decided to get sober. And we learned um, very quickly that you have to do it. No one can do this for you. So my sister, she knew right away, no, I'm not, I'm not calling anybody for you if you want to get. So anyway, um, what happened was um, we did go see the primary physician that my father used, and he was embarrassed as hell to take me in to see his doctor. This was very embarrassing. For him. He's like, this is my daughter. You know? And um, I, I, I didn't think I would that bad, but I guess it was pretty rough. I don't know if any of you have a picture on the day you got sober, but I wish I did. Because from the looks on their faces, it must have been really bad. I have no idea how bad it was. But anyway, um, ended up from that moment, I didn't drink anymore. They didn't have room at a treatment center for me, but they did say... Um, go to meetings every day until until we can fit you into the treatment facility. Well, here's Carol. I, I'm kind of, like, I have this vision in my mind that I'm like a princess, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get sober in Florida. Sunshine, beaches, and this is going to be great. So I'm like, cool, I can do some meetings, and I'm they're outside of Naples, Florida. And so... I'm driving to this little local meeting and I'm walking in. I'm thinking I'm really cool shit because here I am. I'm doing this on my own. You know, they told me I could stay if I went to meetings. And I knew a little bit about the meeting scene. So I sat there and said, hi, I'm Carol, an alcoholic. I'm waiting for somebody to tell me how wonderful I am, right? And they're all like, well, it's nice to see you. Hi. I was like, hmm, okay. So I did that for a couple of weeks. Then went into um, treatment, which this treatment facility, there were three major ones in that area. One was where like celebrities go and they get all the medication. They were happy recovering alcoholics. Let me tell you. <laughs> and then there was mine, which was much cheaper and you couldn't have coffee. You couldn't have candy. You couldn't have. So it was, it was like, you're going to get sober or not. You know, so we would all meet up at the same meetings, though. And there was this one guy, and I'll never forget this, because I love meetings. I, I think they're great. But there was this one guy. He was Italian, and he had on this shirt, and he had it unbuttoned all the way down. He had his, you know, tan chest. And he'd walk in like this with two women. He went to the expensive treatment facility. And I'm telling you what, that guy was happy. And I was like, He's liking those drugs in that treatment facility a lot better than what he was doing on his own because he was he was content. And and I was kind of jealous at that time because I was still sick. But then, you know, as I've gotten sober, I'm like, thank God I wasn't him. You know, I'm glad they just cut me off of everything and I had to just get sober, you know, if that's what I wanted to do. And I made a choice. I made a choice 
in Florida. My mother did pass away while I was in treatment, unfortunately. And um, that was a tough moment because she died of cancer. I was killing myself. There's a big difference. You know, and when when you're faced with a person choosing to destroy their life for one fighting for their life, if you can't see it, you know, at least for me, that's how I felt. How can I do this? So when my mother passed away, that was my um, my commitment was that, you know what, Mom, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to use this program. I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do because life is precious, you know, and, and we don't know how long we have. And I got to tell you today, when I, there, there's this little saying, it, um, you know, live as if today is your last. That means a lot to me. You know, every day I'm like, I'm going to live this day as if it was my last. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to be drunk because I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. It's just gotten so good. Um, Since I got sober in 2002, you know, I was thinking before I got here, what, what would be the focus of this meeting for, and the message I hope I can um, give to you, you know, it's all change. It's all change. That's all this thing is about. I liked the party and, and I was always looking for something to make me feel good, to change how I felt. That's what the alcohol was all about. And that's why my entire childhood, you know, I was miserable in my home because everybody was drunk and I wanted to escape that. So I would drink. Then I got to high school and, and I was like, I didn't feel like I fit in. So I thought I'd drink to change how I felt so I could do what I wanted to do. And be a part of, and then got into Atlanta, and I'm like this little country girl from Ohio, and I'm like, oh, I got to act cool, so I'll be a groupie, and I was going to change and be a groupie and do the band thing and fit in and drink and party, and all of it was empty. All of that was empty. Since I got sober and changed and, and used what's in these rooms and what's in that big book, all of a sudden, I'm full. I changed in a different way that I don't need a substance to make me feel whole. I don't need, um, as you can tell, an outfit (laughs) to make me feel whole. Um, It's inside. What AA gave me was the thing I was missing inside. And they talk about the spiritual awakening, you know, when you work the steps and you have this spiritual awakening. And Ira and Jerry will know who I'm talking about. Um, but this lady from our Friday night group, when I first came in, her name is Paige. She shared in the meeting something so amazing to me. And I think I had like a year or two sober. She said, they were talking about what is a spiritual awakening? And she just had a way with words, does have a way with words. And she said, you know, a spiritual awakening, if I could explain it to you in words, what it is, I would but I can't until you do the work. You will never understand what a spiritual awakening is, but I can tell you this. It is the best feeling you'll ever have. And I was like, who is that chick? I want to know her. I want to know what she's talking about. What is this thing that she feels inside that I have missed my entire life? that I want more than anything. How do I get that? So I started using that sponsor. And the sponsor led me through the steps to the point where one day someone looked at me and said, you've changed. And I'm like, huh? Again, that baffled feeling, like, who are you talking to? It can't be me. It had happened. The miracle had happened for me. And I honestly believe that at that moment, when the spiritual experience happened for me, or this awakening, I began to see life differently. What used to be important to me really wasn't that important anymore. And the things that are important to me now are so awesome. Um, 
I am single. For some reason, I'm still working on this relationship thing. <laughs> that is messed up. People are not easy for me. And um, so I am working on that. But um, because I'm getting older, the one thing I had always wanted to be was a mother. Well, you know, when we're out drinking and doing what we do, it's really not a good place for a baby. And for some reason, the big guy upstairs protected that child from me. And and I say that because I'm blessed. I, I could have really hurt a child. And so when I got sober, it finally, I wanted to be a mom. But again, where's the husband? I can't find him. I think he's missing. Um, but I decided I wanted to adopt a child. You can't do that when you're out drinking and all the other stuff I was doing. No one would even consider it. And so um, I have a 20-month-old daughter now. And it's been, yes, she is um, from Oklahoma City and the birth mother. I met her four days before Elizabeth was born. And let me tell you something. We sat on the couch, and I felt like a sponsor. This girl, I loved her. She was kind and smart. But guess what? She had a problem like we have. And we sat there and talked. And she, I said, you know, honey, I said, you haven't ever given up a, a child for adoption. And I've never adopted anyone. Neither one of us know what, what's going to happen here emotionally. But um, do you think you might want to quit using? Because she used meth throughout the entire pregnancy. And she said, you know, people have suggested that this would be a good time for me to do that. She said, but I just, I don't want to quit yet. And, you know, somebody who's not us would be judgmental, wouldn't they? They'd be like, you're an awful person. How could you say such a thing? And I looked at her and I said, yeah, they really wouldn't do you any good to do it now then if you're not ready. And she looked at me baffled. And I told her, I said, well, I can promise you this. And I never did tell her I was an alcoholic because I didn't want her to change her mind. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I did counsel her as well as I could at that moment. Um, hey, I wanted my baby. Um, <laughs> I'm still an alcoholic, damn it. Um, but I did, tell, I did tell her, I said, I can promise you something. I will love your baby and I will protect her, and I will take care of her. And you know what the cool part of me saying that was? I, I knew I could do it. I knew I could do it now. If I had said that, and I'm sure I did back in the day, I had probably said things like that a million times and knew I was lying through my teeth because there was no way under God's big blue sky I could possibly do any of the wonderful things I said I was going to do. And what a miracle to be able to have this little girl and love her, and take care of her. And God only knows, I may cross paths with Erin one day, her birth mother. I don't know. We we communicate through pictures. I let her see her, and and that's a, I, am, I have control issues too. But, um, you know, I, I felt a connection to this woman, and I can only tell you that God's got a hand in it. Um, I don't know what it is. But that was a big change, and then... Um, since I've been sober, my family relationships are much stronger, and I'm actually moving to Ohio on Friday to help my parents and to do something really, really cool for my daughter. She's going to get to be around horses and cows and and, and just have this whole world that um, if I were drinking, it wouldn't happen. So when I share my story with you, and I think about change, when I first got sober, I never imagined in a million years what would become of me. You know, I just knew it when I was down and out, beaten and tired, that I just felt like shit, and I just wanted the pain to stop. 
you know, just stop the pain. And, and for God's sake, can I just tell the truth for a change? I don't know how to tell the truth. And now I'm dealing with things that are so much better. You know, I'm not worried about when I wake up in the morning, how many people did I lie to last night? And, oh, who was that guy that was right here? I'm not doing that anymore. My life has just gotten so much better. And I know the only way it happens is by coming in here and genuinely surrendering and saying, I'm done. I'm done with the way I, I, I'm living. And I want to change. And I'm not perfect since I've had Elizabeth. I'll just tell, I'll put it all on the table because that's what we do, right? Um, I got her, and I remember sponsoring women with children and saying, you need to do a meeting, you know, you got to have at least two, three a week, you know, because I was single. Now I have my daughter. And, and I'll tell you, one thing that has slipped are my meetings. And I, I'm with one of my sponsees right now, Sandy, whom I love like a sister. And we were talking, and she said, what do you miss, basically? And I said, well, one, I'm, I'm not hearing the message on a regular basis, which a good alcoholic, I need to hear the message. I need to remember what this is all about. But two, I miss the camaraderie, the fellowship, the connection to people that... Um, is so valuable, so very, very important to me. Um, You know, talking to someone on the phone is great, but it's different. It's different. So I have made a commitment because I don't know how many of you went to treatment or not, but before I left treatment, they said, what's your relapse prevention plan? And I had to write it out, right? And of course, you know, 30 days sober, I was like, well, I'm just going to go up to Atlanta and I'm going to go get my meetings and I'm going to get a sponsor. And I said all the right things, but it's because I knew that's what I was supposed to say. I'm a good alcoholic. That's what you want me to say. So I'll say it. Thank God I actually followed through on it. But what I can tell you today is I am going up to Ohio. I'm going to find where the meetings are. I'm going to get a sponsor in Ohio. And I'm not saying it because it's what they told me to write on the paper. It's because I know it works. And guys, I don't ever want to go back to my old lifestyle. And I I now have something so very, very, very valuable to me. I would never want to put her through what I went through as a child. You know? And when I took on that responsibility of a little girl, that's big stuff. And I know the chaos of living in an alcoholic home. And I know the chaos of being an alcoholic, an active alcoholic. And I never want to go back to that. So what sounds ridiculous on paper is the best medicine. So when I get to Ohio, I've already set up my plan of action because I have found that the best way to stay sober is to keep moving. Um, I have... Um, decided to participate a bit in, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm telling you my story, so it's part of me. I am participating in Al-Anon as well because um, my father, whom I absolutely love and adore, I'm going to be closer to him now. And that's not easy. He's a powerful force. (laughs) He is a powerful force. And I want to stay sober. And sober to me is not only um, not drinking. It's about staying spiritually fit. And my father has the power with me right now, because I'm still in in um, in, in work in progress. Um, He knows where the buttons are. He knows how to turn me on and turn me off like that. And I don't know about you, if, if, if I'm having a bad day, and he hits the right button, that could be a trigger to say, you know what, the beer sounds good. I can't let that happen. So I'm constantly remembering things that are taught to me um, about what this program can do. I think of people who don't have it. You know, we hear that a lot in the rooms. How How do normal people get by? Because they don't have this book to guide them, you know, on the how to live life skills. Um, I can open up that book and I can find an answer to a problem like that. And I'm so grateful. 
so grateful for that. Um, Jerry, you wanted to hear a, a funny story about my drinking, and um, I'll, I'll share one. Okay, I'll share one funny story because it just, I'm going back to Ohio, and this kind of takes me back. I told you in high school, drinking was just fun, right? And um, so I'm in Ohio. I'm 16, 17, maybe 17. I think I'm 17, underage anyway. But we had this little country bar called Gus's. And in this small country town, they didn't really mind if cute girls came in and got drunk and danced on the bars. That was entertainment, right? And so all of us, we would do Dr. Pepper shots or something. I don't know what we were drinking, but it was enough to get us up on the bar. And, of course, we have our little high heels on, and we think we're like, I don't, there was some stupid movie out about that. But anyway, so we're up on the bar dancing, and somebody went to give me another shot as I was dancing. And... As I go down, my foot slipped, and I did a head dive into the floor. Um, and and you know the slow motion? You're like, oh, and I go down, and I see all these hands reaching to me, but none of them helped me. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm still perplexed by that, because I saw their hands. They were there. But here's what a good alcoholic does. She stands up, and she says, can I have another shot? <laughs> because that's how I rolled. You know what? And then the next day, thank God it was the 80s and I had these bangs. So <laughs> when when I woke up in the morning and I went to the bathroom again, one of those moments, oh, shit. Um, there's this huge knot on my forehead. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get upstairs without anybody seeing that? And I just rolled those bangs right over it. And I was like, <laughs> got it. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't know what possesses us to to have an experience like that and then continue on. You know, do we just write it off as, oh, that was just, you know, fun. And that was a minor one, you know. There was another time um, I had a little VW bug. My dad believed in classics because he said, you know, everybody needs a classic. And I think it was he was just trying to save money. But we got this little 1969 Beetle, and and literally it rattled. And I would drive it from Auburn to Ohio from college. Those things aren't meant to go 65 for 12 hours. So when I would stop at gas stations, my hands would be shaking. And at the gas station, someone would have to push me so I could jump start it, you know, the clutch. I was getting pretty good at that. But anyway, this little car, what was nice is that if you wrecked it or something, it didn't matter. And we would sneak out to Gus's, to this little bar. I would come home after I met everybody in town. Then I would come home and say goodnight at about 10 o'clock to the family. And then I would climb out my window, go down the driveway to where I left the car. Then I'd hop in and go back out and party till 4 in the morning. One night I'm coming home, and it's raining. And in this little beetle... There's this bridge, and there was water on it, and a hydroplane. And I went over the bridge, and the car goes sailing. I mean, it was like the love bug. We're flying. And I go between trees, a fence, and into someone's yard, and I do a 360 in their yard, stop with my headlights in their front window. That sobers you up. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, shit. what do I do? Is it going to start? And it started, and I pulled out. Good alcoholic. The next morning, my mother and I are going into town. Mom, look what somebody did in their yard. Can you believe that? Because I had to see my damage. And I had to write it off. These are all signs, right? Normal people don't do this shit. But that's what I did. Now, I am a cautious driver. I have valuable cargo in my back seat. Um, it's a great life. I went and changed it. That stuff, that's just Russian roulette. Eventually, you're not going to be lucky. Eventually, it's going to stop. And that's what happened to me in 2002. And I'm, I'm truly grateful that God gave me another chance to try this thing and live life. And, and I've decided that with him, I do much better than I do without him. And whoever your higher power is embrace that and let it give you strength so that you can get up in the morning and you can just 
look at life and say, I'm going to do a little bit better today, you know, and, and it does, it just keeps getting better and better. And I have no idea how long I'm supposed to speak. So I am going to tell you that I have enjoyed being here tonight. I'm truly grateful for the opportunity. I was probably all over the charts, but I can tell you this is closing. I love sobriety and I hope you do. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.